My friends, as uh, the title says, two-way truss rods suck canal water. And that's just the bottom line. To hear more about that, and to hear and see more about my giant wood furnace that had to be turned on last night, stay tuned to right after this. Hello my friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. You can probably hear things running in the background. Well, that's the furnace and a little heater I have right down here because it's freezing in here. <laughs> Actually, it's not that cold in the shop. It never gets down to freezing. It's, it's in the 50s right now, but it'll warm up very quickly. Uh, it is insulated and it doesn't get that terribly cold. 50 degrees is perfectly fine for instruments. It's not gonna hurt them in any way. Being Tuesday, we will be playing this evening at Dickie's Barbecue in Rolla, Missouri. So if you're in the area, please come and join us. We would love to see you there. Regarding the temperature here on the farm, uh, it is 28 degrees Fahrenheit this morning. For my friends in millimeter land, that's four Fahrenheit degrees below freezing. That means it's cold. That means frost on the pumpkins. So I had to start up the wood furnace last night. Take a look at this video. My friends, it's a sad day here on the homestead. It's the evening of Monday, the October 17th. Yup, I'm about to do it. What a bummer. I've already wadded up a bunch of newspaper, thrown it in here to get my fire started. And you don't have to tell me about the Morgan's fire starter. I know all about that. The thing is with me, see that right there? That's the only time I do it right now. I start one fire and it burns until spring. So there's no reason to have fire starter when you only start one fire. You see this pile of wood? You know, for most people, this pile of wood would last them, a, you know, a few weeks anyway. For me, this is about one day's worth of wood, if, if it'll even make it a full day. No kidding. I'm not exaggerating. That's not, a, that's not you know, some hype. That's just a black and white fact. That is not much wood for this stove. In fact, I could probably put almost all that wood in this stove. And the problem is, it's going to take almost all that wood before I get all that big boiler up there heated up. There's 400 gallons of water up there. Might as well quit talking about it. Go ahead and get the fire built. Got the kindling in the back of the car here, so I'm just going to throw all that in there, and I'll bring you back when I light her up. Well, I couldn't light it and uh, hold the camera and everything, so she's lit, and it won't take but about five or ten minutes. All that wood will catch on fire. I've got smaller stuff underneath there. That's the bigger stuff, and that's all wood that burns real easy. That's like red cedar and, you know, soft woods. And that'll all catch on really fast. So I'll give it about 10 minutes and then I'll start putting on the smallest pieces and uh, it won't take no time to get a, a good hot fire going, but it will take some time to heat up 400 gallons of water. <laughs> it's been about 10 or 15 minutes. I've already put in some small wood. So let's see what it's doing. You can see there's very little smoke that comes out of this. It burns pretty efficiently. Now it's going to smoke like crazy when I open this door and that's for two reasons. Yeah, see there's quite a bit of smoke comes out. Not too terribly bad this time, but you can see the fire's raging now. So it's not my first Boy Scout attempt at starting a fire. In about another five minutes or so, I'll be adding some of these larger pieces. And the temperature's already come up by a full three degrees, so that's a good sign. It's a sign it's working. The reason you build your fire so close to the door is that allows the heat to travel the full length of the roof before it goes out the chimney. So even though it's a four foot long fireplace or longer than that actually, I could probably put close to a five foot log in there. The, the problem is that uh, you can't pick that up, number one. And number two, you want to have most of your flame toward the front. So I only build a fire across the front and I fill it all the way full, but only really one log deep but completely full all the way across the front. And then that heats the, the water and it's more efficient that way. That's At least that's what they tell you when you buy one of these. 
Well, it's been about another 10 minutes. You can see the piles about half gone. And you can see that's where it went. It's pretty full. I could probably get another piece or two in there if I tried. By another two hours, the temperature will be back up to probably 150, 170. 185 is uh, the max on this before it shuts off. The vent on this will shut off completely and you'll almost see nothing coming out of the chimney when that happens. You know, you don't need a damper on the chimney itself because it just shuts off airtight everywhere in the front and so it can't draw air. And as a matter of fact, you'll open the door sometimes and you'll think the fire's out because you don't see any flame at all. But uh, as soon as that damper opens up, it don't take no time for that fire to come back. Well, my friends, it's the next morning. You can see the smoke is going fairly slow out of the chimney. There's not much force to it. That means the front is shut off, meaning that uh, it uh, won't allow air to go through. And you can see how much wood I have left. Now, that's just one evening and night. And those two logs are big. They're way bigger than they look, you know. And the other logs were way bigger than they look. If you look how big... It is compared to my hand. That's a big log. That's, oh, it's at least 8 to 10 inches in diameter. That's the smaller one. And the bigger one's probably 12 inches across and 8 inches wide at least. Well, there you go. There's the two new logs in there. One of them over here. The other one down here. I could put at least three more that size in there. And uh, you can see that it's still burning pretty good. The temperature is up to 187, which is on the high side. 185 is where it shuts, shuts off typically. So I'll shut the door. No point in burning up any more of that precious fuel. But guess what I get to do this afternoon, since it's actually 28 degrees out here this morning. Which means there's frost on the pumpkins for sure. By the way, that big shovel you see there, I do use that to clean the stove out. But that's not what it's there for, really. That's my poker. That's my fire poker, believe it or not. I mean, it doubles as a clean out, but uh, it's got a long handle and I can reach back in there and move things around. And that's actually my fire poker. And you can see the fire is, I mean, it's still raging in there a little bit, but the front door is closed. Therefore, that's going to slow down to an absolute trickle in a, in a little while. Well, there's the uh, hornet's nest this morning with 28 degrees, and you can see there's no nothing coming in or out of there. Uh, when I made the previous film on Sunday, there was a lot of activity. They were going in and out like crazy. I should have used this angle to show you, but uh, today there's nothing at 28 degrees. Now, that doesn't mean they're dead yet. They may be balled up inside there, keeping themselves warm, but after about the third one of these freezes like this, they are pretty much over with. Well, now you uh, have seen uh, what I had to do last night and to get it going. And then you could see this morning how much firewood I've already put in the stove. Yeah, it's still got enough to burn most of the rest of the day, uh, but that's going to be about it. So now I think you can see how you could easily burn a quart of wood every three days. Because it's not even that cold yet. When it gets down in the low 20s, you don't have a chance. You know, those outdoor wood furnaces are great in the, in the fact that they heat the whole house really well. But they're not great in that they use a lot more wood than, say, your typical wood stoves. But the problem is with wood stoves on that house, as long as it is, it's 144 feet long. Now, keep in mind, we can shut off parts of it. But we'd have to have at least three wood stoves to heat it well. So that would be just kind of a nightmare, trying to keep three different wood stoves filled up. And we do shut it off, but it's just the way it's designed, we can't shut it all off. All right, enough about the problems with the wood. What about the title of this video, that two-way truss rods suck canal water? They do. Uh, by the way, that's hillbilly speak. The college speak would be, the two-way truss rod has only one redeeming quality. And if you want to know what the redeeming quality is, it's that it does at least tighten when you turn it the right way. 
you know, it's pitiful. It sounds like an exaggeration. You're, you're not going to believe me. Eight out of ten of them, when they have two-way truss rods, are adjusted the wrong way. I want to say nine out of ten of them, but I'm trying to be nice. You know, I, I'm not kidding. Every one of these things that comes in the shop is adjusted the wrong way. Not, not just lower mandolins. I'm talking guitars. Everything that has a two-way truss rod, they're adjusted the wrong way. Why is that? I'm beginning to really wonder. This is such a new mandolin, I kind of doubt the customer did that. I don't know. Maybe he did. Are they doing this from the factory? Are there morons in the factory that don't know righty-tighty, lefty-loosey? Because... This thing was turned to the left as far as it would go, and it was tight. I had to turn it pretty hard to get it to go to the right, so I'm thinking, well, it's already tight. Then it broke loose. And you, at first, you think, uh oh, I broke it. But no, you keep turning it, you turn it, you turn it, you turn it. it that's what you call backlash in the thread. So you have to turn it till you catch up with the backlash, and then you turn it a little more. And then bingo, it starts to get hard, and it gets hard, and it gets hard, and it gets hard, and now it pulls the underbow out of the neck. When you turn it to the left, it forces underbow in the neck. And that's what was the problem with this. Now, I didn't say anything to you guys, but on the actual video that you will see coming out in the future, that's the first observation I made, and you'll see that in the video, that I looked at it and I went, wow, this has got too much underbow. Somebody turned it the wrong way. I assume from the factory. That's why two-way truss rods should be outlawed. They shouldn't even be legal. They're fixing a problem we do not have. I am a 40-year veteran of repairing musical instruments. In those 40 years, I might, and I'm just saying might, I'm trying to be nice, I might have seen two instruments that had an overbow. That's what a two-way truss rod can fix. I don't even remember seeing one for sure. I kind of think I remember seeing one. It just doesn't happen. It's just like I said, it's fixing a problem we don't have. Let, let me just give you a stupid analogy. I am sure in the history of this world and the history of automobiles and the history of tires, I am sure somebody, somewhere, somehow, some way, popped a tire with a fork. With a, I'm talking an eating utensil fork. I'm sure somewhere, somehow, somewhere, somebody ran over a fork and it's popped a tire. That doesn't mean we need to, you know, try to fix that problem, because it just doesn't happen. It's the same way with this. We don't need to fix the overbow problem, because it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen naturally, that's for darn sure. That much weight on those strings always pulls an underbow. I am telling the musical industry to get rid of two-way truss rods. We don't need them. We're fixing a problem we don't have. And all we're really doing is creating problems that we wouldn't have otherwise. Now, that's my rant for the day. And every word of it was 100% true. And you can feel free to disagree all day long but you don't have 40 years experience seeing these things. If you did have 40 years experience seeing these things, you wouldn't be disagreeing. You'd be going, yep, you're right, 100% correct. Well, <laughs> now that I got on that high horse, the rest of the day should be a good day. I got that off my chest. Did I sleep good last night? No, you know what I was actually thinking about last night? <laughs> yeah, I know most of you are gonna think I'm making this up. I actually lay awake thinking about how to solve the, the uh, fusion problem. They've been trying for 40 years or more to uh, invent a fusion reactor that will uh, make, you know, nuclear fission obsolete because it will be so much more efficient. The problem is they can't get fusion to work because it takes so much intense pressure to, uh, like, get these atoms to come together that they're trying crazy ideas in my opinion they're they're you know they're taking lasers and trying to force these atoms together with lasers you know the reason it doesn't work well on the earth is we don't have the gravity that the sun has the sun is the closest fusion reactor to the earth but that's the only place that fusion I, that i'm aware of is taking place i mean there are, apparently are some other natural ways for fusion to happen i'm not really up on that the point is they're really struggling with making a fusion reactor. I think it's going to be solved more simple than that. Kind of like the, the flying thing with the Wright brothers. It took, what, a couple of centuries before somebody finally figured it out? And once they figured it out, 
it's actually pretty straightforward. It's not that complicated once they figured it out. Now, I kind of think the fusion thing is going to be like similar to that. You know, I, I was trying to do some research to see if they've been trying centrifugal force on fusion. And I didn't see much on that. I would think that would be the way to go. You get something spinning at a super, super high rate. Now, I mean, it would have to be spinning pretty darn fast, but I would think that would force the uh, atoms together almost better than anything. I don't know. Who am I? But that's what was keeping me awake last night. <laughs> I know you think I'm making that up. I'm not. It's the truth. I am a deep thinker, actually. You know, Einstein and me, we do, we do thought experiments all the time. <laughs> I know you're gonna I know I'm gonna get the hate comments. That's okay. Just go ahead and hate me all you want. I don't care. I'm smart enough not to use a two-way truss rod in an instrument though. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah.